The Secret Library Podcast is brought to you by the Patreon supporters of The Secret Library Podcast. If you would like to become one yourself, you can check it out at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 121 of The Secret Library Podcast. My guest this week is Susan Orlean, the one, the only Susan Orlean, who is an author, staff writer for The New Yorker, dog owner, gardener, parent, frequent lecturer and speaker, an occasional teacher, a very occasional guest editor, a once in a blue moon movie inspiration, and doodler. She's written a lot of books and even more magazine articles. She uh, was an amazing guest on the show before. And when I found out earlier this year that Susan was going to have a book coming out in October entitled The Library Book, of course, I, I was immediately like galvanized into action. I reached out to her. I said, well, obviously you have to come back on and talk about this book, please. The library book on the Secret Library podcast seemed like a no-brainer and Susan agreed, which was great. So she came back on and I love talking to Susan on this episode because on the previous episode, we talked about writing in general, but it was really fun to dive into a very specific book that was a huge research undertaking, was one topic she stuck with over five years of in-depth research, both into the history, the present, the personalities that go into the Los Angeles Public Library, as well as the scandal of a fire that happened in 1986. So this book pretty much has everything. If you're a book nerd, if you're a library nerd, if you're a history nerd, if you're any kind of nerd who reads, you're going to like this book and you're going to like it even better because you've heard Susan talk about how she wrote it. So obviously I'm a big fan girl, but I always love having her on and I know you will love listening. So please join me in enjoying Susan Orlean. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for coming back on. I'm thrilled to be with you again. Yeah, it's... um. As, as I was saying just before we started, I, I felt very, very excited, obviously, that you'd written another book, but in particular that you had written the library book. I kind of did a little happy dance and I said, this, I'm dying for this book. And it is so good. It's so good, this book. I already know oh, everyone, everyone is getting you. it for Christmas this year. I'm like, this is the Christmas book. This is the one. <laughs> it's, it's partly why we, we aim to get it out in the fall because it does seem like it might be the kind of book that people would give to other people for Christmas. Yeah, everybody. Everybody's getting it. Everyone listening, great. don't buy this for yourself. Yeah, great. <laughs> get it for me. <laughs> so one of the things that you said partway through the book, which I thought about when thinking about how much I loved it, was that you said, um, before learning about the library fire, I decided I was done with writing books. Writing on them felt like a slow motion wrestling match. And so I wondered as I was reading this book and loving it and actually reading it with jet lag in the middle of the night and realizing that it was too interesting for me to read in the middle of the night because I was never going to go back to sleep. Um, <laughs> I wonder, did you write this book in a way to sort of reinvigorate your relationship to writing books? And, and how do you feel about writing books having written this one? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, 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 I mean, this was a very honest confession that when I had finished Rinton 10, I felt so exhausted that I began to think, I just can't do this again. It's just too consuming to work on a book, to spend years on a subject, to be writing kind of into the void without any real sense of how it's going to all turn out. And it, it just felt like too big of an undertaking. It's also true that every time you finish a book, you tend to have this feeling that you'll never be able to think of another topic. Um, there's a way that it feels like, how could you ever do this again? You'll never be able to find another subject that you would be able to live with for five years or however long it takes you. It, it felt to me like this was demanding to, to be written. I mean, the combination of having this revelatory moment of being reminded of how important libraries had been to me growing up, 
com- and then combining it with finding out about this fire that I, I mean, I have to admit, I just thought I've never heard about this, the largest library fire in the history of the U S that's a great story. Uh, you know, given that I thought, I don't think this is that well known of an event, but it's a very dramatic one. It, I felt like I was being pushed into writing this book. I convinced myself as one always does that it would be very easy <laughs> and that I could, <laughs> I could do it really quickly. And five years later, I emerge thinking, here I am again being tricked into doing another book. And it, it really did seduce me as a subject. And I suppose in a way that's a great thing to have happen, that a subject is so compelling that you simply can't resist it. It's almost a better way of doing a book than deciding I want to write a book and begin looking for a topic. Uh, This was something where the topic found me and seemed to demand being written. So against, against my better instincts, I thought, well, here I go again. And uh, about two or three years into it, I thought, how did I end up doing another book when I had decided not to do any other books? Well, there you go. It it just snagged, it it kind of reached out and grabbed me. I I can imagine. I mean, this is, in some ways, I think this is one of those books where It's a cliche to say this, but it is the epitome of you can't make this stuff up. Right. Absolutely. From the cast of characters who ran the library early on to the people who run it now to the letters from people about the tips as to who they thought burned the library. (laughs) I mean, those uh, those in particular, I was like, oh, my God, you can't make that up. You just can't make it up. I know. And, you know, it was part of... One of the rules of thumb that I use when I'm writing, even if it's just a magazine piece, a story has to get more interesting as you learn more about it rather than less interesting. If, as I I begin working on a piece or a book, and there's a feeling of, I already somehow knew this, or there there's not this sense of discovery where I'm constantly coming back after a day of reporting, just brimming with new information and, and particularly with that feeling of saying, you just cannot believe, you know, my husband is always the recipient of me going, oh my God, you're not going to believe what I just came across, or you're not going to believe this fact that I just learned. There is a quality of constant surprise that this story had that made that kept me engaged through to the very end because it was just more and more head scratching surprises and whether it was about as you say the the historical material as well as the present day it it all felt urgent and surprising and that's where you can't resist a story. It knew how to get you. I mean, one thing that I thought was really amazing is, you know, somebody who obviously has a really long standing relationship with New York, which has its own incredible library. Um, you wrote something really great about writing about a place, which was um, sometimes it's hard to notice a place that you know well, your eyes glide over it seeing it, but not really seeing it at all. It's as if familiarity gives you a kind of temporary blindness. And I I wondered if the fact that you relocated to LA and had written about it for articles, obviously, but hadn't lived here as much, did it change your relationship that it was the New York, um, that it wasn't the New York Public Library fire, that it was the Los Angeles Library fire? Absolutely. Um, Part of the nature of this was me learning about a new city that I as much as I had visited here, I didn't know it. I didn't know downtown. I didn't know the library at all. For me, the 
it, it was partly learning about my new home and hearing about the city as only a newcomer can. And that's being full of, of wonder and, and curiosity when you grow up somewhere or when you've lived somewhere for a very long time, it, it ceases to surprise you in the same way. And you, you become a little inured to it. That's just the nature of living somewhere, being a newcomer and having that impulse to discover and to learn about a place and also not taking anything for granted. It's a new place. You're learning everything for the first time. So it has a freshness and a, a, a quality of surprise that it can't really have if you're overly familiar with it. I also I have to admit, as much as the New York Public Library is you know, the premier library in the country, everybody accepts that, everybody acknowledges it. It was really satisfying <laughs> to write about a library in a city that people don't think of as being very literary. And in fact, that's completely wrong. LA is a very literate, literary city, the, a rich tradition of writers and and literature about it and emerging from it. And the contrarian me in me made me very happy that I was writing about a library in a city that is wrongly thought of as n not being, I mean, someone had said to me, oh my God, I didn't even think anyone in LA read. And I thought, <laughs> oh, I am so glad to be writing this book because you are so wrong. And that was of the pleasure of it was discovering the deep literary roots that the city has and the the fact that this library was driven its development was really driven by a kind of passion to demonstrate to the world that LA was a city of books and not a city that was just about movies and television but in fact, a city of books, which it, it certainly is. Yeah, it really is. I think there's one of the things about, you know, as someone who lived in Los Angeles for a long time, there is a lot of PR you have to do for LA when you live there. And yes, <laughs> you have to kind of, it's almost like this underdog thing, which I, I enjoyed, but I moved there from San Francisco originally and everyone, you know, loves to love San Francisco and people love to hate on LA. And, um, I loved your descriptions of the city. And the, one of the things that I love most about it is it's just wackadoo history and the oddball characters that show up there. One of which, one of my favorites was the, the librarian. I'm, of course, blanking on his name right now, but the one who walked to L.A. to accept the yes. job and had two favorite outfits, which would shock people even today. Yes, yes, Charles Lummis. And, yes, you know, it, it is true that, LA even now has the the uh, temperament of a young city, and certainly in 1900, when it really was still a very young city compared to New York and Philadelphia and Chicago, that had at that point they were old cities already. They had been around for a hundred and some years and had a long standing, more um, traditional kind of hierarchy and deep wealth and a kind of conservativeness. California and Los Angeles in particular, because I think San Francisco also had that more traditional kind of old city quality. Definitely. LA was young and and wacky and it attracted wacky people. It had a a kind of DIY quality about it, which is I I perceive myself to be a white Indian and therefore, you know, and I'm referring to Charles Lamas who dressed in 
cowboy and Indian clothing most of his adult life. Because even though he was an Easterner from Boston, he he just invented himself as that personality, and he could get away with it in L.A. And I think he would have been drummed out of town in a more conservative city like Boston or New York. So the the openness in L.A. to invention is part of what makes it so attractive and so so interesting and so eccentric in a really deep part of its DNA. It's a city that tolerates and encourages a kind of eccentricity. Definitely. And I think you you had a full gamut of characters, including Harry Peak, who, you know, maybe his eccentricity got him into more problematic spaces who right. is sort of the, the central mystery with all that hair. I love the description with all that hair when he was in the courtroom. <laughs> but can you say a little bit about what it was like to research Harry Peak? Because that also feels like a slow motion wrestling match, trying to research someone like that. Yes. Well, Harry Peak was a really interesting character. And as I discovered when I began working on the book, he had passed away. Uh, I had fully expected to spend time with him because he's, he wouldn't have been an old man. Um, he was a wannabe actor from, uh, east of LA, a kind of, uh, unsophisticated, um, sprawl suburbia east of LA and he moved to Los Angeles like so many people do with this dream of being an actor, of being noticed, of being special. He was a fabulous. He was somebody who could not control his need and desire to fib and to tell stories, which made him, in an interesting way, a sort of, you know, writing about a library is writing about the phenomenology of storytelling, since libraries are, are our temples of storytelling. And Harry, in his own way, was one of the, um, I would say he was a compulsive storyteller about himself and about, he, he couldn't tell an unadorned version of himself as, if his life depended on it. Writing about him was fascinating and maddening because it was very hard to tell what about him was true. Right. By his own version, by his family's version. I still don't really know what was true about him and what wasn't. Everyone in his life had that same experience of him, which was that he simply could not tell you would say to him, where were you this afternoon? And even that he couldn't answer as a straight story. So there was something really fascinating and ultimately exasperating about writing about someone who couldn't present an unembellished story about himself, no matter what. It felt like an illustration of the boy who cried wolf, because all he did was cry wolf, and it kind of became the perfect alibi for him. Even when he started saying, I set the fire, nobody believed him. Because he would say, I had lunch with Tom Cruise yesterday. So they'd think, well, is that the same thing? He's never told the truth before. Why would he tell it now? Exactly. I mean, it's very funny, because somebody who is a more ordinary person saying, all right, I set the library on fire, you'd think, oh my God, they're confessing. This must be true because this is a person who is an ordinary person who basically says things about themselves that are true. If they confess that they committed a crime, you would believe that, all right, it's a a true true confession. With Harry, because he was such a liar, even when he confessed, you had to assume it was a lie. And then you would think, well, all right, he confessed. Who would confess to a crime that as a lie? Well, 
somebody who wanted to be the center of attention because attention for him had no positive or negative. It was all positive. So there was no such thing as negative attention. I mean, if you say who, well, what sort of idiot would confess to committing a crime like setting a public library on fire? Well, this is somebody who couldn't resist the opportunity to place himself in the center of drama. Well, he took coffee and donuts to the police people who, you know, to the people who were tailing him when they started to suspect maybe he had done it. Yeah, I think that in a weird way, he enjoyed the attention of being trailed. Uh, You know, they had assigned a detail to, to trail him so that they could gather more evidence to prosecute him. He, unlike most people who would think, oh, my God, I've got to try to evade them and make my movements as undiscernible as possible, he goes and brings donuts and coffee to the police car. It's like something (laughs) out of Beverly Hills Cop. It's almost like he was watching Beverly Hills Cop and was going to, you know, stick the banana in the tailpipe and, like, recreate the Eddie Murphy shtick. Right, exactly. And, you know, he... It was a some a quality that was almost childish and childlike that, you know, kids will do bad things sometimes just to get attention. And you feel like there's a point in maturity where you realize that you don't want to do bad things to get attention. You would like attention for good things, but you know, most people when they mature, stop doing things just to get attention. Harry never went past that point in his life. He, he just needed attention. He wanted attention. And even uh, to this day, his confession leaves me, uh, you know, I can't tell. It, it, it's a story that you think, why? He had no reason to want to set the library on fire, and yet maybe he did it. Maybe he did it to get attention, or maybe he didn't do it at all, but it was a big event, and he fibbed in order to place himself in the center of this big event. It's very hard to know. Yeah, it's a fascinating conundrum, but I I think it's something that's enjoyable to puzzle out for yourself as you read. And alongside of it, there are all of these other kind of things and other personalities that are surrounding the whole thing. One of one of whom I loved hearing you talk about, and I wanted to talk about the sort of interviewing process that you went through and, and spending time with people. But one I really loved was Wyman Jones. I think one of my favorite sentences in the whole book was your description of what it was like to interview him which was talking to him was like engaging in a fist fight with someone gazing at himself in a mirror while punching you, which I thought was unbelievable. Um, so, and also the fact that you managed to interview him multiple times, right? And we couldn't get him off the phone, even though he kept saying from the beginning, I don't want to talk to you because he was writing his own book. Yeah. And it, it, it was actually one of the funniest, strangest experiences because He was, um, you know, he began by saying to me, I'm not going to talk to you. And he was very insulting and said, you're not a librarian. You can't possibly write this book. I'm writing a book. And I know all about this. You don't. And I thought, well, darn it. I'm not going to get an interview with him after all. An hour later, he's still talking And he alternated between berating me and telling me very interesting stuff about his tenure as um, he was the city librarian of Los Angeles for about 20 years. And, you know, he had a lot of stories and a lot. uh, He was the city librarian at the time of the fire. So, of course, he was deeply involved in what went on at that time. Um, He was a character. He was an incredible character. 
I thought there is something about this job that seems to attract people who are really unusual. They are not your average Joe. You know, he was not a typical bureaucrat. He was a narcissistic, somewhat irascible, know-it-all who I found extremely funny, although he was also incredibly rude and did not spare an opportunity to tell me how inadequate I was to the task of writing this book. It's so amazing. And yet at the same time, he was very insistent in learning about me. I, he was a very talented amateur magician. And I happened to mention to him that my son at that time was interested in magic the way a lot of little kids are. He sent me several books about magic for my son. That's so amazing. All the while that he was basically telling me that I was barely worth talking to, he would talk to me for hours and then, you know, sent me this gift of these books. I was scheduled to um, go up to Portland and meet with him, which I, I was really excited about uh, because he was such, he just fascinated me. Yeah. And, and it was funny that he agreed to have me come visit him, given that he was barely willing to talk to me, or so he claimed. <laughs> um, unfortunately, he had a, a bad fall and oh. his health, and we had to cancel the trip. And then his health declined um, precipitously from that point, and we we never spoke on the phone again. Uh, and he passed away a couple of months ago. And, and he's he was well into his eighties, so it wasn't a shock to me. But he had during the course of our many conversations, <laughs> he he was just a, a a one-off. He, he was really a, a, a real character and very much in the tradition of the very eccentric people who have run the LA library over its long history. It doesn't seem like any of them are anything like each other either. It's like they're all totally eccentric and strange, but you never think, oh, yeah, that one's like the other one who came before. They're all completely different. Yes, exactly. You know, there are, um, I I think that was actually one of the very interesting things for me about learning about each of them, because they, they were all very different. You know, you had Charles Lummis, who is this kind of frontiersman, cowboy, who had these wild ideas, but also some very brilliant ideas of how to develop the library. You had Mary Jones, who was a, a kind of conservative, I, I should say more conventional person who ran the library in a very steady way and then was basically fired um, being told that uh, the library should have a man running it. And then suddenly... Which was outrageous because women had run it for like 45 years at that point. Right? I know. It, it was a very strange turn of events. But she became a very hard-charging feminist when she was uh, told, and this was in 1905, and rallied an enormous amount of support from everyone including um, uh, Susan B. Anthony, supporting her in her efforts to keep her job. And then you have someone like Wyman Jones, who's his own, you know, from his only mold, which I, to uh, operate in a cliche, they clearly broke the mold after they made him. Right. And, uh, it, it's a real range of people who've been all very different, all very, all fascinating, all brilliant in their own 
unique way. Do you think there's something about the library or is it something about Los Angeles or or what do you think it is? Because I mean, I, again, don't know anything about who's run like the New York Public Library or the Boston Public Library or, you know, the Smithsonian or whatever. But I, I don't know that it would permit this level of eccentricity, perhaps. And right. maybe yes. L.A. is sort of proud of it. Is is there something about the L.A. Public Library, do you think, that, that channels that in some way? I Well, I absolutely think it is part and parcel of the nature of L.A. that you are attracting people who are drawn to this new, fresh, rather original city where you can invent a persona for yourself, essentially. And I do think that that's probably, you know, I'm also not familiar with who's run the New York Public Library, who's run the Philadelphia Library, but it it is very much i think characteristic of los angeles of california and of the you know the la public library is a city institution that's connected to the city in a way that's um different from the new york public library it's very much a public institution it hasn't ever been run by wealthy donors uh, the way some of these older libraries are very dominated by wealthy conservative donors who've set policy. The LA Public Library has, it's a city department and it it's just been wide open the way these older libraries have not been. That's true. That's an I had, I hadn't thought about that, but I think that's exactly right. I have a, a large question <laughs> um, that shifts us slightly. So you spent five years. I mean, at one point, there's there's one librarian at the library, um, Glenn Creason, one of the senior librarians, and you said during the months I spent with him, you know, there are these little touches throughout the book that indicate the scope of time that this book took, and uh-huh. I'm really. I, I couldn't get my mind around how this got distilled into an actual book and not, you know, another encyclopedia. And like, I can't imagine how many <laughs> notes you have, how many details you have, how many letters of the threats that were made about who set the library that you had to sift through to pick the ones that you picked. So how did you translate this research into a book that's not 3000 pages long as it clearly could have been? <laughs> oh, it definitely could have been. Um, It was a big, big challenge because I was operating um, several different timelines that that I I didn't want to tell the book simply chronologically starting in, you know, 1897. I think it would have been really off putting to most readers. So I, I and I really wanted to capture a sense of the library in its day-to-day life today, it was very, very challenging um, to have all the material from the founding of the library, all the material from the day-to-day life of the library today, all the material on the arson. I mean, it, it was sprawling, not just in terms of the breadth of the material but the depth of the material and I didn't want it to be a 600 page book I'm not a fan of books that big I just I wanted it to be readable for people who weren't looking for an encyclopedia as you say on the library or on LA for me the it was a process of distillation of just plucking out the most interesting salient material, the, instead of running 10 letters that came to the library by people who thought they knew how to solve the arson, but instead to pick three. And it meant that there was a lot of good material that didn't end up in the book, but it was a, it was an editing process in terms of the material. Um, I 
set up a pretty elaborate system of how to organize the material so I could find things. I'm um, dying to hear about that. Yeah, you know, it it's something that is a version of the system I've used in the past where I transfer information onto um, five by seven index cards mm. and, and then put the index cards into thematic groupings and lay them out and begin to orchestrate a kind of structure from, you know, and this was, as I said, I was talking about the deep history of the library starting in the 1800s, the 1980s and the whole story of the arson and Harry Peak, and then the present day, as well as a another thread which was about libraries throughout time, uh, everything from what happened to libraries during the World Wars, what what the future of libraries is. So I was really braiding four strands together. And I didn't want the book to feel choppy. I didn't want to go like, all right, now you're in the Library of Alexandria, and now you're in 1986 in L.A., and now you're in the present day in the shipping department, but rather make those um, connections feel natural, that you were moving back and forth in time. Um, and that was partly uh, done just by what felt organic to me, that writing about Harry Peake gave me a chance to back up and write about the Nazi book burnings in World War II and then move into the present day uh, talking about, you know, I wanted to write about each of the departments in the library and move back and forth to that present day of, you know, what's it like in the history department or sitting at the circulation desk or being a security guard. I would say that it, I tried to use my gut about where the story can move at different moments uh, among these four very distinct sections. Yeah. I will say I would have gone on for 600 pages. That's just my vote. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there was certainly enough material. I mean, maybe I... Maybe there's an know, addendum. Maybe you have yeah. like... Like, you know, the, here's a book, like a coffee table book of research notes or those letters or other things. I think there's something there. Oh, my there. God. Yeah. Well, there was so much great archival material that I found that, I mean, I could barely resist, you know, as you say, like those, you know, people were writing notes to the library and to the police telling them, you know, giving tips. And many of these tips were completely crackpot. Or personal, I, like just trying to yeah. bust someone that they clearly had a personal problem with. Right, right. I mean, you very clearly, it was somebody had a beef with someone and decided to rat them out and say they were the person who had set the library on fire. And it it was hard to resist including them all because each one was more nutty than the other. And, and you know, gave me a sense of another aspect of LA, which is this sort of kooky energy of culty, crazy, just oddball notions or, you know, going to a psychic and the psychic making predictions about oh, who yeah, would sit the library great. on fire. And, you know, he's a, an average guy who claims to be 25,000 years old. But and when he, he channels just, him, he's got an Australian accent. Yeah, right. It, it just was, it cracked me up. And I thought this is all part of creating a fabric within the book that is a portrait of L.A. in its own way. This is what happens when there's a crime in L.A. These are the people who who surface, who are filled with tips and, and completely oddball crackpot 
you know, tips and, and theories on what happened. And that's part of the nature of the city. I think that it's, it's got a, a kind of eccentric energy that you see at moments like that. Definitely. One of the things that I, I loved learning was, I mean, one of them was heartbreaking, the, the collections that they had that were lost in the fire, but also learning things that they have now, like the collection of the Thomas guides that they brought CJ in to, to index and that he could identify yeah. what page your address was on when you gave him your uh, address. This is amazing. It, oh, it was really amazing and fascinating. Um, the Yes, there were terrible losses in the fire. And and it's, it's very interesting because my first thought and the thought of a number of people who I've talked to was, well, couldn't they just go buy and replace the books? I mean, what's what's the big deal? You just, if you raise enough money, you just go and replace the books. Well, th it's not that easy. I mean, when you build a collection of say cookbooks that they had one of the largest cookbook collections in the country, you, many of those books, while they're not rare in the sense of having been created in small numbers, but they're rare in the sense that they're out of print. They're not easy to find. They'll never be replaceable in, you don't go to Amazon and order a 20,000 volume cookbook collection. It just, that can't be done. The books come from thousands of different vendors. Many of them are small independent publishers. You know, that's what is special about a library they build collections of books on topics that aren't merely running down the bestseller list, but rather they're deep and, and broad. Um, and they include many books that are not the, the easily found common books on the subject. They do have remarkable, wonderful collections now that, some of which were things that didn't get destroyed in the fire and have been built since then, developed even further. And some are newer collections that have just begun, collection of, for instance, playbills from pretty much every play that's ever been produced in L.A. Uh, in the case of the Thomas Guides, that was um, developed through, largely through this, collection that was about to all be thrown out the feathers map collection which belonged to a hoarder a map hoarder who passed away and his house had uh close to a hundred thousand maps and atlases in it and it all got donated to the library so that's the kind of thing that libraries have that are unique to libraries that they develop these collections or they get they're donated by patrons special things that that aren't just you know they're not the things you would find in a bookstore or on Amazon they are part of what makes libraries still distinct from these other sources of books that they have these collections that have been accumulated from other sources. Definitely. I, I love that about it. And it does make you want to kind of visit lots of different libraries and see what those parts are. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing that's really interesting is that the, each library is different. I mean, the LA Public Library has its collections. The New York Public Library has its collections that are different and unique. And that, you know, the idea that everything in the world has been digitized is simply not true. That there is an enormous amount of material in a good library that has yet to be put, you know, it hasn't been digitized yet. You have to go yourself, request it, sit there, pour over it, um, and it will be... The, the idea of digitizing everything in the world is something we will never catch up 
to, it's simply not possible or certainly not in our lifetimes that everything will be digitally accessible. There's tons of stuff that exists where you have to walk yourself into the library and look at it. Um, Charles Lummis developed this autograph collection and these, he got more than 700 autographs that included drawings and doodles and um, more than just the signature of people, the best known people of his time. Those you have to go and look at. Those are not yet digitized, but there, there's so much material in the, a library. I mean, there, the LA public library has thousands and thousands and thousands of photographs. It will be into the next century before they would ever get them all digitized. So I, I kind of like that. I mean, I do too. it's very convenient to be able to go online from the comfort of your living room and look at things in the library. But I, I sort of love the fact that there's still a lot of material that you can only see by going down to the library and saying, I want to see the World's Fair maps in the Feathers collection. And those aren't online. They exist. They're fabulous. I mean, I can't encourage you enough to go see them. They're beautiful. And for the time being, they're not digitalized. So they're, your chance to see them is in person. That's, it's, well, I hope that everybody, upon reading this book, then goes and visits either the LA library or whatever library is closest to you so that you can build a relationship with that one. I think that you've made quite a case for, for that process with this. You know, book. I, I think that there is, I, I mean, the convenience of things being online uh, is fantastic. I am not a Luddite and I'm not anti um, digital access and, and the, and libraries are making much of their material available, even having their catalog online is a giant step toward that. But it's, um, first of all, important for everyone. And I think in, in the case of writers for young writers to realize that just because something isn't online doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And that it's sort of important to get out there and go to the library and go physically see what there is because there is a lot that is not online but it's also a joy for for all of us who through our tax dollars support libraries to realize that there's all sorts of great stuff fun stuff to see at the library you know the LA library is a huge menu collection it's and I think it may be the biggest collection of menus in the U S and they are a historical artifact. They're funny. They're ephemera. They're, they're wonderful. It's that's really fun to go for the day and ask to look at the menu collection. You would not get through the whole thing. So, you know, there, there is a flesh and blood experience of a library that remains important and really very delicious. Um, and it's, it, if this book inspires anybody to go poke around in their library and they haven't done it in a long time, well, I will be thrilled. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's likely to be the result. Well, as always, Susan, I could keep talking to you for probably another three hours about this book, but I won't, um, I won't keep you away from other conversations you're having about it. And I want to thank you so much for, for coming on to talk to us. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, really, it's such a joy to talk about this book. And I'm, I'm so thrilled that you got a lot of pleasure out of it. It really makes me happy. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. 
You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.